So in the last video, we kind of described what a conditional distribution of coefficients is. We kind of went through this thought experiment to think about how to kind of construct the group that we're talking about when we talk about this distribution. But now let's actually formally define mathematically what, what this conditional distribution is. And we're going to start with a random utility model with random coefficients, just like we did with the mixed logit model. Uh, we're going to make one kind of slight alteration, though. We're going to think about some kind of a panel data setting. And we're going to think about a panel data setting here because it's going to turn out that, that these conditional distributions of coefficients are kind of better defined uh, as you observe more and more uh, choices that an individual makes. So if you only observe one choice, you can still get some sense of a conditional distribution. But as we see more and more choices, uh, we start to get a more and more refined view of what that conditional distribution is. And so a lot of times you will see uh, these kind of conditional distributions discussed in, in kind of a panel setting where you see people making many choices. So we're going to add a T index here. So we're going to talk about the utility that decision maker N obtains from alternative J in choice situation T. That could be time T, but there could be other ways that you define choice situations, maybe even in an experimental setting where, where you know, you're, you're, you're exposing people to the same choices, but maybe randomizing the order. So you don't want to think of it as an ordered panel, uh, but, but maybe, you know, kind of the, the definition of each choice setting is specific. Uh, anyway, uh, if it's easiest to think about T being time though, that, that's totally fine. Uh, but other than adding the T index here, this is exactly the same random utility model that we saw with the mixed logit model. We're going to assume that the, the, each individual has their own coefficients, beta sub n, and that that's consistent over, uh, over the, all of the different choice situations that we see. And so, you know, X, X is once again just the data, the attributes about the decision maker and the alternative in that specific time or situation T. The betas are those individual specific coefficients that come from a population density defined by F. And then epsilon is just an IID extreme value random utility term. Now, just to simplify notation as we go through here, let's kind of collect uh, each of our T specific data and choices into a larger kind of matrix or vector. So let's define X sub N. This is going to be all of the data collectively for individual n over all the alternatives and all the choice settings that, that they see. So we're just kind of collecting all of the all of the x sub njts into one kind of big x for that individual. And y sub n, now let's think about this one a little bit longer. If we have multiple choice situations, we're going to have multiple choices. We're going to see this person chooses alternative one first, then three, then two, then one, then two. You know, we can see this whole vector of choices as opposed to just a single choice. And so let's call that full sequence of alternatives y sub n. So this is going to be a sequence, however many ch choice settings, capital T, let's say, we're going to have capital T different choices being made. And we're going to collect all of those into one vector that we call this kind of bold Y to indicate that it's a vector of choices. So let's once again, kind of think through a thought experiment. We did this with the mixed logit model. It's basically the same idea here. If we knew a decision maker's coefficient, beta sub n, then the probability of that decision maker choosing a specific sequence of choices, Y sub n, when faced with choice settings, X sub n, would just be the product of conditional logic choice probabilities. So if we knew someone's beta sub n, this problem would just reduce down to a logit problem. Because there are multiple time periods or multiple choice situations, we have to multiply all of these logit choice probabilities together. But ultimately, it's just based on kind of a simple conditional logit choice probability that takes exactly the form that we're used to from, from, from talking about the logit model earlier in the semester. Of course, we don't know each individual's coefficients. So we have to consider kind of the unconditional distribution of coefficients in the population. If we don't know anything more about these people other than just that they come from the, the population that has a, a density defined by theta, then we just integrate over 
over the density of coefficients that we observe in the population. And that's how we get all the way to the choice probability. So this is just kind of restating something about the mixed logit model that we talked about a couple of weeks ago. But we're doing it with slightly different notation to kind of acknowledge that we will generally have multiple, multiple time periods or multiple choice situations when we're thinking about these conditional distributions. But we get to exactly the same place we got to with the mixed logit model, the choice probability in this, in, the, in this case for a sequence of choices is the integral of the conditional choice probability, conditional on beta times the density of beta and are really integrated over the density of beta. So once again, this is just this is basically just restating the mixed logit with just some slightly different notation. But now let's think about what this term, this the integrand actually is here, the probability of y conditional on beta times the density of beta. You can think of this as telling us the joint density of that sequence of choices y and beta. If we take a conditional probability of y sub n times an unconditional density of beta. This is just basically telling us what's the joint density of, of, of our choices and of the betas. Well, we could think about basically doing the same thing, but switching the conditioning here. So what I just described and what's in the formal definition of the mixed logit model is the conditional probability of choices times the unconditional density of coefficients. Well, we could instead think about reversing our conditioning and getting a conditional density of coefficients times an unconditional probability. So just to, to say this, here we had conditional probability of y, conditional choice probability, times unconditional density of coefficients. Now let's instead think about just reversing the conditioning here and we end up with a conditional density of coefficients times an unconditional choice probability. And by Bayes rule, these two expressions are exactly the same. So we can switch the order of conditioning and we get exactly the same, you know, two equivalent expressions. So we can say that the conditional density of coefficients times the unconditional choice probability equals the conditional choice probability times the unconditional distribution of coefficients. And this is important because it's, it's ultimately this H object, this H conditional density that we care about. And so now we've gotten an expression that's gonna get it for us. And so if we just start from this joint density expression again and rearrange terms, we just move our unconditional probability over to the other side, we now have a, an expression for the conditional distribution of beta. So if we think back to the first video, we talked about this, this concept of a conditional distribution. It's if we have some group that all faces the same choice setting and we wanna know what is the distribution among that group that chooses a particular choice, or in this case, a, a particular sequence of choices, now we have an expression to actually mathematically define that density. And there's a couple of things I wanna point out about this density. Uh, the numerator here is, is just the integrand of the mixed logit choice probability. It's that conditional choice probability times the unconditional density. And the denominator is the actual mixed logit choice probability. And so it's kind of like we're taking the piece inside the mixed logit in choice probability integral and dividing that by that full integral. One thing that this kind of does uh, is that ultimately the denominator here, the mixed logit choice probability doesn't depend on beta, right? It depends on theta. It depends on what betas look like throughout the population, but it doesn't depend on any particular beta. And so you can think about the denominator here as essentially just being like a constant scaling factor that doesn't vary with beta at all. And so we can kind of think about it. It's not going to drop out mathematically, but when we think through what's going on here, we can kind of drop it out. And we can see then that our conditional distribution 
of coefficients, our h, is going to be proportional to the product of two things. This conditional choice probability, which you can think of that as like the probability that an individual with coefficients beta would actually choose y sub n. So if we're thinking about a particular beta, what's the probability that that beta could actually create, generate the set of choices in question? That's the first piece. And then the second piece of this product is just this unconditional density. What's the likelihood that we observe that beta in the population? So kind of amongst this group, that would choose a particular alternative or sequence of alternatives, the density of that group is going to be proportional to the probability that that coefficient would create the choices that we're thinking about and just the likelihood of observing that coefficient in the population at large. So I think there's some nice intuition here, right? If there, if there, if a particular coefficient just has a low likelihood of occurring out there in the population at all, then it's even conditional on choice, it's still gonna have a relatively low uh, likelihood of occurring within this particular group. Um, and then similarly, if uh, even if a coefficient occurs often out in the population, if that coefficient would kind of be unlikely to create or generate the kinds of choices that we are thinking about here, then, then that's also going to kind of get downweighted in this calculation. And then the opposite for things that are either very likely to occur in the population or, or very likely to generate the kind of choices that we're thinking about. So I think there's some nice intuition, some, some nice intuition here. And so that's going to be our formal definition of a conditional distribution of random coefficients. Oftentimes it's gonna be easier to work with kind of specific statistics that are based on that conditional distribution. It's nice to have a, this kind of concept of what the conditional distribution is, but we're often gonna be doing things with that conditional distribution. And in the next video, the final video for this week, we're gonna talk about some of the things that we can actually do with this conditional distribution. It's gonna be more useful, I think, than just kind of thinking about the conditional distribution itself. So we'll talk about some of these applications of conditional distributions in the next video.